But I thought this year I would do something a bit different and kind of acknowledge the debt that we owe to many years of evolution uh, of sound. In fact, in total, 500 million years of evolution. So we're going to go right back in evolutionary time and look at the very first creatures that started to communicate with sound. So this lovely creature is the African lungfish. And this kind of bridged the gap between underwater animals and overwater animals. And this predates the evolution of the ear. And what this creature did was uh, detect vibration, effectively. Vibration through its entire body and through its lungs, even, which would resonate to allow it to determine the kind of threat that was coming towards it. And the reason that it did so was for purely evolutionary advantage. So it would allow it to avoid predators and to follow its prey. Years later, we see this, the spider. And spiders are amazing things because though they don't have ears, they can also detect vibration. And as we all know, sound is effectively a vibration. But the thing that's really cool about spiders is that they don't just detect vibration. They actually tune the strings of their webs like a, a, a guitarist might. So each, each string might have a slightly different length. And what that allows it to do is when it hears this spying coming from some direction, it actually allows it to know which direction the predator comes from. It's using music in its day-to-day -day life uh, to catch prey and to avoid predators, which in my mind is it's pretty damn cool. Years later, we have this, uh, the, the, the European robin. And the difference here, of course, is that not only can the robin hear sound, it can also make sound. So creatures start to evolve that actually use song and calls to communicate. Uh, they have alarm sounds that allow each other to, to indicate that there's a threat coming. Uh, they have mating songs that allow them to impress a mate by singing the most beautiful melody that they can. And the reason that we're called Chirp, of course, is that we are inspired by this little fellow. And what we want to do is kind of update digital bird song for the age of electronics. Fast forward a couple of hundred thousand years, and we have this chap uh, blowing a Polynesian corn shell. So this conch shell is an early example of tool use in communication. And of course, what tool, tools effectively allow us to do is go beyond our kind of human inbuilt capabilities. So normally, you know, if you shout, you might be able to transmit information over 100 meters, something like that. Blowing one of these bad boys, you'll reach about one and a half kilometers of spread, which is super useful if you want to, you know, call the gang for a ritual, for a prayer, or into battle. And you can imagine how threatening these things would sound uh, on the battlefield. And of course, as tools developed, so too did the sound and the signals that they allowed us to make. So we've got foghorns. We've got hunting horns, we've got military bugles, we've got train horns. And what's fascinating is that as you start to look into each of these, each of them actually has its own semantics. So uh, in hunting, for example, there are a whole series of little melodies that convey different messages. A message to, uh, you know, dive in after the fox, a message to fall back. Uh, same for foghorns, they can convey the exact location uh, and the weather conditions in some cases. And uh, when you go into locomotion, there's a, quite a detailed set of syntax that actually allows you to interpret these horn honks uh, to kind of embed useful meaning within them, which is obviously super useful when uh, there's, uh, you know, these big metal objects coming towards you. So that one honk there means get out of the way. Um, so it, from the 1700s, we start to see these same kinds of signs and symbols embedded within music. Uh, and one well-known early kind of example of this is Johann Sebastian Bach, who was known to actually embed his own initials as a cipher into a piece of music, B-A-C-H. Uh, and you may notice that H doesn't appear in typical Western uh, notation, but in German, uh, this is synonymous with, I think it's B-flat, possibly. So Bach would start to interweave this series of notes within uh, within his compositions as a kind of audio Easter egg, right? So it's there um, if you can find it. Uh, and that gets quoted throughout musical history by people like uh, Schoenberg and uh, Arvo Pett. Similarly interested in these kind of, you know, ciphers and uh, hidden meanings, which we'll come back to shortly. A few years later, we have Wagner, who starts to embed what we call light motifs within his music. And these are effectively fragments of musical meaning, which have, have this more kind of symbolic nature. So this is the theme of 
the ring from uh, the ring cycle. So what he builds up is this kind of landscape of meaning from these little building blocks of music, which I think is a fantastic device and one that you kind of hasn't been as uh, you know adopted as widely as you'd expect in musical uh, you know modern musical composition because it's a superbly powerful way to construct meaning from these building blocks just in the same way that we do uh, in day-to-day -day language. Um, then we move on to the 1800s. Now, can anyone identify this object or tell me what this is used for? Morse code. Yeah, exactly. So this was used um, in the early 1800s uh, as phone lines started to be rolled out um, to convey messages across phone lines that could then be interpreted by a human listener as a series of dots and dashes. Um, and the interesting break here is that we go from this kind of uh, symbolic analogue uh, set of meanings to something which is effectively digital. You've got dots and dashes which can be boiled down to ones and zeros, uh, each of which can conveys uh, a word or a piece of punctuation. This then progressed to create devices like this, what's known as the Hellschreiber machine. And this might sound familiar to those of you that use modems in the 80s. So uh, what this does, it actually sends a bitmap image using the timings of tiny pieces of uh, uh, sinusoidal uh, synthesis, basically. So every bleep conveys the brightness of a pixel, and it kind of scans in this bit, bitmap raster format uh, across the text. And what's kind of interesting here is that, in a way, it's a regression, because actually what it's sending is an image. You know, it could just send a picture, but then we interpret it on screen as text and as meaning. Um, and then as you head into the 1950s in the Cold War era, um, we started to see this kind of weird and wonderful phenomenon crop up. Three, nine, seven, one, five. And for those of you who haven't Three, hasn't heard nine, this before, seven, this is one of one, the most kind of spine-tinglingly weird phenomena in radio and audio history. So this is what's known as a number station. Uh, a series of numbers reeled off by what's sometimes an automated voice, sometimes a human voice, often behind the Iron Curtain from distant places in Russia, uh, Siberia, uh, the Antarctic even, to convey something, but nobody quite knows what. So humans set these up, and the theory goes that they were to convey kind of cryptographic messages to, uh, you know, agents, counter-agent spies. Um, as of yet, there's been no kind of definitive knowledge uh, behind this, but there's some fascinating banks of recordings uh, of these things. And so everything we've seen so far has been human, uh, sorry, human to human or machine to human. But as we progress into the 60s, we start to see the rise of machine to machine communication with uh, wonderful things like this, the 56K modem. So this sound, to anyone who ever used a modem, spells the, the unlimited promise of the internet, dialing up to the web and uh, speaking to distant strangers. Um, um, the actual sound behind it has a few different kind of segments to it, um, which are explained in this incredible uh, poster by a, a signals ha hacker called Una Raisanen. I think that's the right pronunciation. So this diagram shows a dissection of the sound of the dial-up modem. So at the left, you've got these DTMF tones, and each of which maps uh, a single number from zero to nine to a pair of frequencies that then identify it uniquely. And then after that, we start to negotiate a data connection between two ends using what's known as frequency shift keying, which maps uh, effectively an integer to a tone. Um, uh, the rate is negotiated, equalization is negotiated, so uh, each end will adapt its acoustic properties to optimize the speed of the transmission. And then finally, on the far right, you've got this kind of dense uh, cloud of binary data as they, they've established how quickly they can speak. Um, <clears throat> and this then progressed, of course, to the Spectrum uh, and the Commodore 64 data sets, uh, which would again embed effectively program code uh, in a magnetic tape, which you could listen to, uh, but it was mostly intended for this very uh, pragmatic purpose of loading your favourite game. Um, and the sound that we just heard, in fact, isn't a game, but it was a visualisation uh, which was embedded as a B-side into a 70s record by Pete Shelley of the Buzzcocks. And this was, a, this was effectively like, a, 
you know, a, a, an early prototype of the kind of visualizations that you might now see in uh, processing or Winamp, this kind of thing. So as you loaded this into your spectrum, you could then play it alongside the record and see uh, a kind of real-time visual accompaniment, uh, early generative music video. And then there is another side of sound as a kind of interface, so as a way that we can interpret data from the world around us. And one of the things that's cool and unique about audio is that we can listen to sound whilst not being too distracted from other things that are going on. So we can keep our kind of you know, visual focus whilst having the second data stream coming from audio. This is a field that's known as sonification uh, and in some cases auditory display for things like ear cons, a prompt that tells you that something has happened. Uh, this is probably the best known example, a Geiger counter, which enables you, through the kind of density of its ticks, uh, to determine the level of background radiation uh, around you. Um, but there are many, many more great examples of this. So um, in operating theatres, for example, surgeons and anaesthetists use audio uh, as an indicator of the vital signs of a patient. So while they're um, getting messy and doing the operating itself, they can have this additional audio interface uh, that gives them this constant insight into, uh, you know, the, the vital status of the patient. And the one that I particularly love is this. So in the, in the late 70s, NASA um, were having some problems with the navigation system of the Voyager 2 space probe. They couldn't figure out why it was going off course, um, get, getting these huge streams of data. And they then took that data and put it through a sonification process, so um, mapped the, uh, effectively the vibrations of the craft um, into audio and could hear what was going on. And what they heard, unfortunately there's no recording, but it sounds like a hailstorm, basically, and they realised that what was happening was that it was being bombarded by all of these tiny fragments um, of meteorites, micrometeorites, and that was what was throwing it off course. Um, and there's a super interesting bank of modern day sonifications, actually, on NASA's SoundCloud site, if you're interested. Um, the fascination with ciphers and hidden meanings then carries on um, to the modern day. So uh, this track by Kraftwerk, Radioactivity, embeds uh, Morse code within it. Which, if you pass through a Morse code decoder, spells out the word radioactivity. Um, and then in more modern times, there's been a big fascination with these images that I'm sure some of you may have seen. So this is a spectrogram um, of a track by Aphex Twin, whose name is un unpronounceable, uh, known as Equation. Um, and he has basically reverse engineered audio from a spectrogram image uh, to create, well, this uh, piece of work. So as you pass this audio through a frequency map, this is what you see uh, over time. And there's loads of cool examples of this. Venetian snares have done this quite a bit. Um, the Mr. Robot TV series did this in one of the later episodes. Um, and oh, I don't have the slider, unfortunately, but the latest Doom game has a whole set of uh, pentagrams mapped through it if you pass it through a spectrogram. Um, and so that brings us to today, where we have all sorts of cool and interesting uses of audio as a data carrying medium. Obviously we have things like Alexa, voice as an interface. Um, we have the work that we do in Chirp, mapping data into sets of uh, tones, which can be audible or inaudible. Um, and then we have a load of really cool, freak, uh, sorry, domain specific applications of this. Uh, so the teenage engineering OP1 uses audio to uh, embed patch information that it can send over its audio interface, which is pretty rad. Uh, Yamaha do similar with uh, InfoSound and uh, of course the great work that Shazam do with audio recognition as well. So taking the existing piece of audio um, and then recognizing uh, the content within it. Um, and that kind of brings us to now and the future. So this is a, a, a taste of how we're kind of acknowledging our debts in the past as well. So the sound that you'll hear embeds a piece of information that's being sent from this toy um, in a new style chirp to all of these unpaired uh, surrounding devices. Do that one more time. Hmm. 
Um, so that's a wrap over 500 million years of the evolution of sound and signaling. And if you want to include any of this tech in your work or products, this is what we do day to day at Chirp. Of course, we make tech that embeds information in audio. So if you wanted to you know, embed a teenage engineering style patch transfer into your kit, then we have the tools that you'd be able to do that with. And we love providing the tech for free for uh, you know, open source and DIY projects. So come and have a chat afterwards if you'd like to have a play. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, do we have any questions? No? Okay. Thank you again. Cool. Just Thank you. one more hand to Dan.